Calling all do-it-yourself ETF investors. Do you want to ring the bell at the Toronto Stock Exchange? Join us for ETF Investor Day, our first ever in-person event right here at the TSX on Thursday, February the 8th. This investor education event will be focused on empowering Canadian ETF investors and providing informative content to help you navigate markets in 2024. There's going to be three exciting educational panels, which we've curated specifically for our ETF Market Insights audience. Our insightful guest speakers, who are ETF industry professionals, will provide you with the information and education you need to confidently manage your investment portfolio. This will be an amazing opportunity to learn from ETF industry specialists and to network with like-minded investors while expanding your investment community. You won't want to miss this event. Register today at etfmarketinsights.com. We look forward to seeing you here with us in Toronto. And welcome to our Views from the Desk podcast to kick off Q1 of 2024. My name is Erica Toth, and I'm an ETF specialist at BMO Global Asset Management. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Alfred Lee, who is Director and Investment Strategist at BMO Exchange Traded Funds. Alfred, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, so today we're going to discuss our balanced and our fixed income ETF models. Uh, they've been running uh, for, the balance model has been running for over a decade now, and the fixed income, I think, has been running for over six years now. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how they fared in 2023 and also our outlook as we start the new year. So, Alfred, inflation has certainly come down compared to a year a year ago where we were, um, but the market is pricing in now five rate cuts by the Fed next year. What do you think? Is that a bit too dovish? I think it's a little bit over aggressive. I mean, you know, we were pretty early on this disinflationary uh, trade. Um, so a year ago, you know, we were highlighting how uh, we were going to see a lot of disinflationary pressure on this podcast a year ago. And, and you know, here we are a year later. Uh, CPI is about 3.1% both in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, but when you look at, you know, uh, interest rate expectations uh, between five to six rate cuts in, in 2024. It's a lot. Very, very, yeah, very optimistic, right? So, I think when you look at that, it's it's almost as if you know it's if you assume the economic backdrop that uh, we see in the U.S. so very uh, very robust. Um, you know why are we going to see five to six rate cuts? You know if they start cutting rates, why would do, they do successive rate cuts? And if we do get a recession, it's almost as if you know five to six rate cuts isn't enough. Um, I also think when you look at the runway for rate cuts in 2024, it's not as long as people think. I mean when you look at uh, the Fed, they probably want to see CPI at the 2% range for a number of months before they're comfortable in cutting. So that brings us into April or May. And then at the end of the year, we have the U.S. presidential election. So they probably want to stay out of the market during that period. So that runway is a lot mm -hmm. shorter than people think. And what about in Canada? Like investors are also expecting rate cuts here by the Bank of Canada. Canada was the first to move rates on the way up. Um, so can we expect them to be ahead of the Fed again? I think so. I mean, I, it, it definitely is looking that way. I mean, when you look at the economy in Canada, a lot softer than it is uh, in the U.S. Um, also, when you look at the CPI in Canada, so when you look at the individual components, it's really coming from that shelter component. And when you look at shelter, you know, it's really a function of interest rates. As interest rates go up, mortgage payments go up, and rents are set off with those mortgage payments. So I wouldn't be surprised to see um, the Bank of Canada to go first. Um, and, you know, in terms of rate cuts, I wouldn't be surprised if they do more than the Fed. So, you know, going back to the Fed, I'm not saying that they're not going to do any rate cuts, but I wouldn't be surprised to see maybe two or three rate cuts rather than five or six. And Canada, um, probably within that range, but more likely to do cuts and, and more rate cuts than the Fed. Okay. Now let's put you in the hot seat a little bit. We'll chat about the model portfolios. Um, so let's talk about what worked well in the portfolio in 2023 and maybe what worked less well. Can you walk us through that? Sure. Holding me accountable. I like it. <laughs> uh, but in terms of what worked well, when we start with that, uh, technology was a trade that worked out really well. So uh, we traded in or we uh, moved into ZWT, which is our covered call technology ETF. 
Um, as you know, the technology trade worked really well last year as interest rates or interest rate expectations moderated and as the Fed paused on interest rates. So that was great for technology. Uh, the Magnificent Seven did really well. Mm -hmm. uh, our cover call technology ETF, essentially what we're doing is we're holding the 30 large cap uh, technology names in the US and we're writing call options on top of this portfolio to generate a little bit of yield. So it's a good way to play, play technology, um, especially... You know, in this kind of a market where the larger cap technology names have outperformed uh, the smaller cap names. So, you know, as we go forward, we continue to like technology. We think, um, you know, when you look at AI, it's not just about artificial intelligence, but we see technology as a major driver driver going forward. And, um, you know, I, I guess we could talk about the trades that did not work as well. I'd say REITs is one that did not work well in our portfolio. Um, as you know, with Canadian REITs and our equal weight REIT ETF, really underperformed last year. And the, the reason why is because the, you know, the retail operators and the office property operators uh, continue to see a lot of headwinds and uncertainty in those spaces. Um, but as we move forward in 2024, I, I think that asset class is undervalued because you know, that asset class is very interest rate sensitive. So if we do get rate cuts, I think REITs are going to be very well positioned. Certainly being very beat up over the last year. Um, and what I like about, you know, the exposure there is that it's equally weighted. So you're not, you know, concentrated in one area of the REIT market. You have exposure to industrials, to retail REITs, a little bit of residential REITs, healthcare as well. So it's a, a nice uh, spread out time kind of exposure from that sense when you look at the different subsectors. So I think that's an area that you know, could, could give some good value going forward. Um, so let's talk about the U.S. bank sector. You know, now that we're chatting about sectors. So you know, that was uh, the U.S. banks had a terrible year. It was one of the big sort of dramas in the markets in uh, 2023 with, you know, the insolvencies of uh, Silicon Valley Bank and then a number of the other smaller regionals. Um, so they're highly levered to rates, of course. Um, at, so, and we actually had removed um, our U.S. bank exposure out of the portfolio in favor for uh, to, to add that technology piece that you were just talking about. So. Um, speaking of U.S. banks, then, you know, would you be a buyer at these levels? Is that something that you're considering? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, U.S. banks, I think, is going to be an interesting trade because, you know, I do think they are very leveraged to interest rates. So meaning that if interest rates continue to go down or if they start to go down, rather, um, you know, U.S. banks are going to perform very well. And the reason why is because, you know, when you look at those regional banks that had a lot of issues, the reason why they had issues is because they took their deposits and put them in these held to maturity portfolios where they were, you know, high quality assets, but they had duration exposure. So as interest rates went up, that basically, you know, left their investment portfolios under par or underwater. Um, so that basically put a lot of pressure on the regional bank. So if interest rates start going down, that's going to take a lot of pressure off of those held to maturity portfolios. What's interesting, however, is that, um, in March of 2024, that bank term funding program, so that facility that the Fed set up uh, in which they could exchange those health and maturity portfolios in exchange for par value, that's set to expire. So I think you know, with US banks, if interest rates go down, they're highly levered on the way up, but there is a lot of downside. And I like that technology trade a lot better because you're still okay. getting an upside if interest rates go down, but you don't have that same kind of downside risk. Okay. So speaking of, you know, risk assets in general, I mean, um, you know, we're looking at the the Canadian banks. That was another area that that underperformed in the past in the past year, um, but, you know, ended the year with with a strong rally. Um, so can we anticipate this to continue? I mean, that, that is one of the highest sector weights in, in the portfolio. So what's your outlook uh, for the Canadian bank sector? Yeah, we've been pounding the table on these Canadian banks. And as they say, even a broken clock is right uh, twice a day, right? So I, I think with Canadian banks, um, very similar to U.S. banks, except they're you know higher quality, obviously, uh, but similar in the way that they're leveraged to higher or leveraged to interest rates. So as interest rates come off, if we do see Bank of Canada start cutting rates, I think you know the banks are going to perform very well. Um, in December of 2023, they you know, they rallied because of interest rate expectations. But if we do see rate cuts, that's going to benefit the banks in two ways. I think one, um, that's going to cause the yield curve to potentially normalize, meaning that short-term rates are going to come down. Hopefully get, we get an upward sloping yield curve. 
And, you know, banks are lenders, so they borrow on the short end of the curve. They lend on the long end of the curve. Um, so that's going to be great for the Canadian banks. But in addition to that, if we do get lower rates, that's going to take a lot of pressure off of their loan book. Um, so if we get non-performing loans come in, you know, lower than the provisions that they've set aside, that's going to be another catalyst for the Canadian banks. And even though, you know, Canadian banks ended 2023 with uh, a significant rally, when you look at the valuations on a forward-looking PE ratio basis, they're trading at about a 10 times earnings rate now, which is about you know, a 30% discount to the overall TSX. So still a lot of value there. And now if we just shift gears and talk a little bit about our broader core exposures in the portfolio, uh, we've been advocates for pairing low volatility factor ETFs with quality factor ETFs. Um, so, you know, we saw low vol sort of lag in 2023 and and quality do very, very well. Um, how are we positioning for this year and what's your outlook for each of those factor exposures? And those ones pair very well together. I mean, you know, when you look at the interest rate environment, if you anticipate, you know, interest rates remain uh, the same, quality is going to do very well just because, you know, we one of the screening factors in quality is low financial leverage. So you want companies that don't carry a lot of debt load. So if interest rates remain high, they're not going to get in a whole lot of trouble. They are, you know, higher quality as the name suggests. Um, in addition to that, if interest rates go down, there is a technology component to quality. So it's, you know, a lot of the mega cap technology names. So they're going to perform well in, a, in an environment where interest rates are going down. But if interest rates start going back up, low volatility is going to perform very well, um, as we saw in 2022. So we like com combining those two. Uh, ZUQ, which is our MSCI USA high quality ETF, uh, in addition to ZLU, which is our US uh, low volatility ETF. We find when we combine those two together, the max drawdown of the combined position. It's a lot lower. A lot lower than the S&P 500. So we like them. So talking about fixed income now, uh, any changes to the bond portion of the portfolio? Uh, maybe you can talk to us about that. I, I've been getting a lot of questions and I'm sure you have too over the last uh, several months about adding duration. Um, you know, would you look to add something like a, a ZTL, a long treasury, U.S. long treasury exposure at this point? Or would you say, you know, after the last month where that's really rallied, is that a little bit too late? What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, you know, even when we're out on the road, uh, we see a lot of advisors adding duration to their portfolios. Um, our asset allocation team, so MAST, uh, I believe they added duration to the portfolios uh, in November. So great call on their behalf. Um, but the way we've been playing duration is basically through that barbell trade. So we like having exposure to the short end uh, using investment grade credit. So we have ZSU, which is our um, US short term investment grade uh, ETF, which is hedged back for the Canadian dollar. Uh, we like that position on the short end because one, um, it provides exposure to a lot of U.S. investment grade names that, you know, we just don't have exposure up here in Canada to. Um, also, you know, if you anticipate that the Fed is going to start cutting interest rates, you're exposed to that part of the yield curve that I think is going to benefit. In addition to that, uh, on the other end of the barbell, what we have is ZTL, which is a long-term U.S. Treasury ETF. Um, that's the way that we're getting duration exposure in our portfolio. Um, but overall, when you look at our overall portfolio, how we've been trying to get that duration exposure or that you know, exposure to interest rates is through the equity side of our portfolio. So we have you know, exposure to the banks, the REITs, um, also things like technology. So we do have exposure to interest rates, but it's more so on the equity side of our portfolio. Yeah, and I should also mention to the listeners that you know, if you're looking at the U.S. Uh, short-term uh, corporate bond, the ZSU that you mentioned, and if you're looking at the ZTL, the long treasury, the U.S. long treasury ETF, the weight of the uh, short-term corporate bonds, the ZSU, would be a lot higher, right? So just a reminder that, you know, if you do take on a longer duration exposure like ZTL, the U.S. long treasuries, that can be a lot more volatile. So just something to to keep in mind when thinking of that. And we do have as part of the core, we have either, depending on which portfolio you're looking at, we have the ZAG, which is our aggregate bond ETF for Canada, or we have the ZDB, which is the discount bond uh, ETF, the discount bond version of the aggregate. So we have that sort of as a core position. And then we 
add on the other the other satellites. So, um, you know, listeners can consider something like an aggregate exposure if they want to add duration as well. The duration would be in the seven year or so range rather than the 17 year range. And you're still getting a very, very high credit quality. So that's always something that I, um, you know, when I get asked about that duration question that I bring up because, um, you know, so, sometimes that volatility can be too much for investors to handle on, on the long end of the curve. Um, so you do have on, on, still on the fixed income side of the book now, um, you do have a small position in ZTIP and that is ZTIP or uh, U.S. Uh, inflation protected securities, uh, so short term uh, tips. Um, so we are seeing some heavy dis- disinflationary forces right now that we talked about at the at the beginning of the recording. Um, so what purpose do you see this position playing in the portfolio? It's basically a low cost insurance policy uh, in case inflation comes back. So as you know, we, we've been pretty big on this uh, disinflationary uh, trait over the last year. Um, but I would say, you know, as, as much as the Fed and the Bank of Canada has done in terms of reining in inflation, we're, st- we're still not necessarily out of the woodworks yet. I mean, you know, there are, it, it is very possible, not very possible, but there is a slight possibility that inflation comes back. And when you look at you know, the two-year U.S. break-even rate, it's about 2.1% right now. So you know, the way we see it is that, you know, ZTIP is basically, you know, a very low cost um insurance policy in case inflation comes back. So right now we continue to hold in the portfolio, but if we see CPI, you know, let's say move down to the 2% range and if it's sustained at that level uh, for a number of months, that's when we exit out of that position. I was going to ask you actually, you beat me to the punch there. So what's going to cause you to, uh, you know, what metric do you look at to decide whether you want to boot that out or, or keep it in? Um, so lastly, you added a new position to the portfolio. So um, ZLSU, which is our long short U.S. equity strategy, uh, that would be considered, you know, sort of the alternative sleeve. Um, so maybe you could talk to us a little bit about the rationale there. Sure. Um, you know, when you look at our portfolio, um, you know, instead of the 60-40 portfolio, which is, you know, what I call a traditional balance portfolio, we run more of a 55, 35, 10 model, which is basically, you know, what I would consider a modern day balanced portfolio. So, you know, especially in an environment like this, when, you know, stocks and bonds are still positively correlated, you want some exposure to, you know, non-traditional assets or alternatives um, that is going to provide, you know, additional diversification to your portfolio. So we have, you know, things like preferred shares in there um, that are non-diversified or diversified, provide diversification, you know, above and beyond traditional stocks and bonds, but something like long short strategies will provide additional diversification as well. So what we're trying to do is just improve the overall efficiency of the, you know, entire portfolio. Uh, What I like about the long short strategy is one, um, you know, in case the market starts to sell off, you do have those short positions in the equity portfolio uh, that will benefit if the market sells off. Um, in addition to that, you know, this portfolio is managed by the same portfolio manager that created the low volatility portfolios, my colleague, uh, Chris Heeks. So, um, you know, we like this exposure. We pr- believe it provides additional diversification to the overall strategy. Um, and it's, you know, potentially going to improve the risk adjusted returns of the overall strategy. Very interesting. Uh, definitely food for thought to, uh, to consider and, uh, you know, fresh uh, new year to position the portfolios for. So thank you for sharing your your insights with us, Alfred, and and talking to us about the portfolios. Um, last question, totally unrelated to any of the model portfolios. Uh, Alfred and I are, um, I'm going to say chip connoisseurs. So to the people that don't know us, we, we have a, a bit of a chip problem. And um, whenever we get the chance to get together, we compare notes about different chip flavors. So I'm going to ask you uh, your favorite go-to chip flavor for 2024 and any recent discoveries that you want to share with us. And then Uh, I'll share mine after you go. I'm going to say ketchup. I always go with ketchup. Uh, I know it's a boring answer, but it is a very Canadian answer. Um, But I I find it very hard to move away from uh, ketchup chips. I've recently gone back to an old favorite, which is uh, Cool Ranch. uh, Oh, yeah. But those are those are my two go-to's. I would say. 
So my go-to, my core uh, chip exposure in my chip portfolio is the Ruffles Sour Cream and Onion. And that doesn't change. Doesn't matter what the year is. That's sort of my my uh, my top pick and it's served me very well. And then my um, my new discovery, actually, one that I find is interesting. If you know the President's Choice brand, you want to try the Korean barbecue one. So that is my my hot tip for chips for 2024. I'll check those out. Well, thank you, Alfred. Always a pleasure chatting with you. And I look forward to getting together in Q2. Likewise. Thank you for watching this week's episode of ETF Market Insights. To stream any previous episode of ETF Market Insights series, please visit youtube.com slash ETF Market Insights. Remember to hit subscribe and sign up for alerts so you know when we post new content. Also, we invite you to visit our accompanying website for ETF tools, education, and much more at etfmarketinsights.com. Once again, thank you for watching. The session provided is for information purposes only. Any reference to a particular company or product is for illustrative purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice or recommendation to buy or sell. Particular investments and or trading strategies should be evaluated relative to the individual's investment objectives and professional advice should be obtained with respect to any circumstance.